Mike, can you just try again? Sorry. Sorry, it sounds like we had a glitch. It's uh, Mike Stevens speaking. I don't know. I'm sorry, we've had a bit of a glitch there. I don't know what happened. Hopefully, it's coming through live now. So I'm Mike Stevens. I'm the president of the Ballarat Mechanics Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Twilight Talk. This is the last, uh, the first, this is the last series and the first Twilight Talk in this series. Uh, Sam McCall will tell you about the rest of the talks at the end of uh, the talk this evening. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that the Ballarat Mechanics Institute uh, stands on the land of the Wadarong people and acknowledge their elders past, present and future. Prue Bentley, BMI board member and local ABC chief of staff will be the moderator this evening and she'll introduce our special guest, Hugh McKay. Prue, over to you. Thanks very much for that, Mike. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to be here. How well do you know yourself? Well, it sounds like a simple enough question, but our guest tonight will explain that not only is it one of the toughest questions we might face, most of us are doing everything we can not to answer it. I hesitate to introduce Hugh McKay as a psychologist and a social researcher because his book reminds us just how limiting those kinds of labels can be. But for pragmatism and for a point of reference, I will push on. Uh, Hugh, you might remember, is also the man behind the highly influential Ipsos McKay report, which has looked deep into the minds and moods of Australians since the late 1970s. Hugh has been studying us, our values and preferences, trends and social changes for years, but now it seems he's turned his focus inward. And his latest book, The Inner Self, The Joy of Discovering Who We Really Are, is a captivating, if sometimes personally confronting examination of that very question. How well do you know yourself? And a follow-up, how willing are you to confront that real you? I'd like to invite uh, Hugh McKay now to talk a bit about his book and its ideas, and then we're going to follow up uh, from about six o'clock with a brief Q&A where you can ask your own questions in that chat function. So it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome to the Ballarat Mechanics Institute live stream Hugh McKay. Thank you very much, Prue, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be virtually in Ballarat. It's uh, absolutely one of my favourite regional cities in Australia. I, I long wanted to live there, but anyway, I've ended up in Canberra and that's lovely also. Uh, so thank you for the invitation to talk about some of the themes in this new book. Uh, and I want to begin um, with a quote from Emma Thompson, one of my favourite actors, uh, British actor, I'm sure you're aware of Emma Thompson. Uh, when she was about to turn 60, she gave an interview to Time magazine in which she said that she'd reached a point in her life where all the roles that society has so successfully forced upon you, from daughter to wife to mother to professional person, could be questioned. You could take these things away from your face, like masks, one after the other, and go, who actually am I? which Emma Thompson said, I've always thought was a terribly boring question and I now find fascinating. Well, she faced that question on the eve of her 60th birthday and turning 60 certainly uh, is a magic moment for many people, but turning 40 can do it, turning 50, turning, even turning 80 uh, can do it. Big life-changing events can trigger this kind of reflection, a divorce, a life-threatening illness, a brutal retrenchment, a bereavement, a pandemic uh, can do it. And of course, so can pleasant upheavals, falling in love, the birth of a baby, or the first day at a new job. Uh, these significant moments in our life often turn out to be triggers for a bit of self-reflection. Uh, and for many of us, of course, the trigger is that well-known phenomenon, the midlife crisis. Uh, 
which typically happens to us in our 40s or early 50s, when gradually or suddenly we find ourselves saying, well, there must be more to life than this. And actually, there's more to me uh, than perhaps I've fully realized before. Well, the ancient Greeks weren't kidding when they promoted know thyself as the foundation of a complete and fulfilling life. The more we understand ourselves, the better equipped we are to lead a meaningful, purposeful life. To live in ignorance of who we really are is to live a kind of half-life, and who wants that? Now, that's not to say that the journey of self-reflection, self-examination, self-discovery is going to give us a perfect life. Uh, or an uneventful life or a tranquil life, uh, but it's certainly going to benefit and perhaps even transform our view of ourselves and also be beneficial to the people we live amongst because only an authentic person can have authentic relationships. And I think it's true to say, and people have been saying this since the ancient Greeks and no doubt since before them, that self-knowledge is the necessary condition for an authentic life. Now, we're talking about the self as if it's one simple thing, uh, but that can blind us to the fact that most of us have at least two selves, uh, an outside self and an inside self. And in fact, the midlife crisis is often about sensing a gap perhaps an awkward gap between our outer and inner self. So let me explain what I mean by the two selves. The outer self is what we normally call our personal identity. And identity, of course, is a very fashionable topic at the moment. Uh, people are becoming obsessed with their identity, whether as an individual or as a member of a particular group, a particular ethnic or religious or cultural minority in particular. Uh, we talk a lot about identity politics. Well, identity, important though it is, uh, is all about our differences. Identity, as the word itself suggests, is how we identify each other, how we distinguish Prue from Hugh. And we might uh, do that on the basis of gender, ethnicity, appearance, intelligence, behavior, work, roles and responsibilities, ways of expressing ourselves. In other words, identity is all about making comparisons and contrasts between me and everybody else. So in my case, I could say, well, I'm a man, uh, I'm a brother, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a psychologist, I'm a social researcher, I'm an author, I'm a chorister, I, I have this kind of sense of humor, I dress like this, I talk like this, I have certain political and religious and other beliefs and so on. Those are some of the dimensions of my personal identity. Those are some of the ways that people tell the difference between me and everyone else. And yet, as Emma Thompson suggested in that quote, we might not feel as if the answer to the question, who am I really, can be found simply in our identity. Our various roles as partner, friend, colleague, parent, neighbor, etc., is not the total story about who we are. One of my professional heroes, uh, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with his work, uh, the, the pioneering American psychotherapist, Carl Rogers. If you haven't read his work, there's a wonderful collection of his papers called On Becoming a Person. Uh, but Carl Rogers wrote towards the end of his life that one of the most common questions his clients would ask him was this one. How can I get in touch with this real self underlying all my surface behavior? In other words, personal identity the outside self, the shell, is only half the story. The deeper and more significant part of the story, I believe, is the inner self, which is a bit like the seed hidden inside the husk uh, 
of social identity. Now, of course, we're all fascinated by individual differences. What parent, for example, hasn't marveled at the fact that children with the same mother and father can be so different from each other? And yet the most significant thing about us has nothing to do with our differences. The most significant thing about us is not our identity. The most significant thing about us is that we share a common humanity. So I think of this as the great paradox of the self. The deeper we go in our quest to find the inner self, the more we find that our essence is not about uniqueness or independence, but about our oneness, our connectedness, our interdependence, which is, of course, simply to say something that we all know but don't always fully engage with as an idea, which is that we belong to an essentially social species. And being members of a social species, we're herd animals by nature. We're hopeless in isolation. We need families, neighborhoods, friendship circles, work colleagues, groups, mechanics institutes, communities of all kinds to nurture us and sustain us and give us a sense of emotional security. In our criminal justice system, the worst punishment we can think of is solitary confinement. And that's because that is the worst form of punishment for members of a social species. And of course, during the lockdown for the pandemic, many of us on a large scale, many of us have had a brief taste of what solitary confinement actually feels like. But look what happens to us when uh, we're cut off from the human herd, particularly for long periods. We suffer. We don't just suffer from the obvious things we think of you know, in terms of mental health, uh, things like anxiety and depression, though the risk of anxiety and depression is greatly increased when people do feel socially isolated. But there are all sorts of physical ailments which are also associated with prolonged periods of social isolation, ranging from uh, increased risk of hypertension, inflammation, cognitive decline, disturbed sleep, addictions. It's no wonder that psychologists are now saying that social isolation is actually a greater threat to public health than obesity is. Now, this is why the deepest wisdom on the subject of knowing yourself always stresses our interdependence and our interconnectedness. Our sense of self is brought to life and given its richest meaning only when it is expressed in social interactions, like that magical thing that happens when a single voice is blended with a choir. As I mentioned, when I was talking about my identity, I belong to a choir. If I stood up to sing a solo, the hall would empty. But when I blend my voice with the other members of the choir, together we produce uh, a beautiful music. Now, this term that I've used, common humanity, rolls easily off the tongue, doesn't it? We talk about our common humanity, but what is it? What is the essence of common humanity? This is how I understand that idea. Because we belong to a social species, because we rely on groups, communities, herds to sustain us, therefore, the essential quality of human nature is the one thing we need to promote the social harmony that is vital to our survival as a species. And that quality is our capacity to love, to show kindness, respect, compassion towards everyone we meet, including total strangers. It's one of the wonderful things about human beings. We can do that simply because being human, we understand that they are part of who we are. Now, I've said our capacity to love. 
uh, we're in dangerous territory, of course, once we mention love, because love is one of those words that's heavily freighted with all kinds of meanings. I love chocolate. I love dogs. I love this movie. I love that book. I love my wife. I love my children. All these forms of love enrich our lives, of course, but when it comes to the essence of human nature, when it comes to the greatest contribution we can make to a healthy, well-functioning society, compassion is the form of love we need to focus on. I don't think I really need to say that, do I, in Ballarat, where you have this brilliant compassionate Ballarat strategy already uh, in operation. But let me say something else about compassion. We typically think of love as an emotion, uh, and that's true about most of those kinds of love that I mentioned in that sweep through all the different things we might love. But in the case of compassionate love, it's more accurate to think of it as a discipline. As I interpret it, compassion is actually not about emotion at all. It's not about affection. It's not about how much we like someone and how we respond to them emotionally because they're appealing in some way. In fact, compassion is not something you feel. Compassion is more like a mental discipline. Uh, it's a way of being in the world. It's something you do. It's, it's a habit in which kindness becomes our default response to everyone we encounter, not just those in obvious need of our help or those we happen to like or agree with, but everyone. In fact, the, the acid test of whether we get what our basic human nature calls on us to be uh, is that we are capable of showing compassion towards people we don't like much people we don't agree with. Now, if that sounds like a bit of a stretch, uh, let me remind you that many people manage to behave lovingly towards members of their own extended family that they don't like much or don't agree with. That's familial love in action. And compassionate love works in the same way. In fact, I do believe that's the test of how civilized we are. Now, I'm not a dreamy idealist. It goes without saying that having the capacity for compassionate love, which we have because we're human, doesn't always translate into the daily practice of it. Let me read uh, a paragraph from, uh, from the inner self. Love brings out the best in us. I'm talking here about compassion. But we don't always want the best to be brought out in us because that seems to demand too much of us. Love promotes goodness, but we don't always want to be good. Love encourages us to live noble rather than merely moral lives, but we'd sometimes prefer to settle for the lazy old defense of unloving behavior. I did nothing ethically or legally wrong. Love nurtures a generosity of spirit, but the temptation to be mean-spirited is sometimes irresistible especially when we're feeling outraged. Love calls on us to forgive, even though revenge often seems more natural. In other words, love is a demanding thing. It's a demanding thing to be a human being. And I want to say a bit more about that in a moment. But this idea that we are at our best, at our most human, our most truly human, when we're motivated by compassion is hardly new or revolutionary, is it? I mean, it's not my idea. Uh, the true mission of the world's great religions has always been to nurture our capacity for love, to encourage commitment to a life of compassion and service to others. Uh, and every non-religious spiritual or mystical tradition and most philosophical traditions point to the same idea, the so-called golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And that wonderful quote from Mahatma Gandhi that I've um, drawn on in the new book, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And that points to this great paradox of the self. 
though we feel unique and special and individual, and we are, as humans, we share a common purpose, which is to preserve and nurture our species, not merely through reproduction, but by creating social harmony. In other words, by living compassionately, which is not, I hasten to say, to be weak or soppy or acquiescent or a martyr to every reasonable claim on us. Being compassionate is not to be a bleeding heart. Being kind hearted is not the same thing as being soft in the head. Compassionate people are not doormats. In fact, you could argue that the ultimate human freedom is the freedom to love compassionately. And yet, as I've, as I've just hinted, love's work sometimes feels like the hardest work of all, doesn't it? Which is why we so often try to hide from its demands on us. Understanding why and how we hide I think sheds some useful light on patterns of human behavior, especially bad behavior that might otherwise seem puzzling. In fact, many of our problems, especially in our relationships, arise from our attempts to hide from this core truth about ourselves. I try to explain uh, how this works in the book by using a metaphor, and I'll just very quickly uh, describe the metaphor here. Think of the human capacity for love as a metaphorical light at the very core of our being. Uh, it's, it's the light that enlightens us, uh, that energizes us, that, that, that gives us, brings us to a realization of our capacity for compassion. But where there is light, there are bound to be shadows. And the brighter the light, the deeper the shadows. Doesn't love. Even romantic love sometimes casts shocking shadows of hate. Doesn't every surge of faith or hope cast its shadow of doubt? And don't our actions often spring from such mixed motives that it's hard to separate the noble from the murky and the light from the dark? Now, if you accept this metaphorical depiction of the self, there's no mystery about the presence of evil in the world. Some of us are so daunted by the prospect of living compassionately, why should I? I can't stand half these people, uh, that we retreat into the shadows of self-absorption, bitterness, envy, anger, ruthless rivalry, hate, or perhaps just a blithe indifference to the needs of others. Look after number one is still a very popular slogan. Well, Plato, as usual, had something useful to say about this. He said, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when grown-ups are afraid of the light. I see hiding from ourselves as a form of self-imposed captivity, yet we do it sometimes for years at a stretch. We might hide in our busyness. That's, that's a great distractor from living compassionately. We might hide in our ambition or in our nostalgia, preferring to look back and wallow in the past than to confront our responsibility to be compassionate and engaged in the present. Uh, our IT devices are a great place where we can hide from the demands of love. And we can hide from one of, one of the oldest of mankind's <laughs> hiding places is our tendency to project our own failings and shortcomings onto others. Well, in, in the new book, I've identified our top 20 hiding places and uh, I might chat about some others uh, with Prue in a moment. But regardless of the hiding place we choose, part of what we're hiding from, I believe, will usually be the challenge of compassion. What will be required of me if I get to the core of who I am? And again, that paradox, once we find the courage to come out of hiding, the main thing we'll discover is that the self is not all about me. Yes, we do have our unique identity. I acknowledge that. But we all exist in a shimmering, vibrating web of interconnectedness. And so, to sum up, when we go deeply into the inner self, we discover that we are built to love 
which inescapably means we're built to connect, to cooperate, to engage, which means in turn that even in the intensely private personal journey towards self-knowledge, even in the process of identifying and escaping from our personal hiding places, our relationships are our greatest teacher. Thanks very much, Prue. Thank you. That is, uh, it's, it, it's a wonderful summation of your book, but um, I do highly recommend uh, for those watching, if you haven't already read it, there is plenty more to sink your teeth into in uh, the inner self. And we are asking for questions now, if you'd like to pop them through on the chat. Um, Hugh, one of the things, I mean, I mentioned this to you earlier that, um, <laughs> that I, I thought I I'm going to give this book to a lot of people at Christmas time. I read it and I saw friends, I saw family, I saw myself in it, um, particularly in those hiding places that you talk about, the top 20 hiding places. It, it's it's a really revealing book in, in that way because it, I think it highlights some of the things we think are really, um, they're not problematic at all. We, we think they're harmless, you know, like busyness, for example, yes. um, as being a place to hide from you know, our tr tourist natures. Do you think, I mean, look, this question is, sorry, I'm rambling on a bit, but this question of, of finding yourself, as you say, it's, it's ages old, but is now, d does now have a particular significance for this question, do you think? Uh, yes, now in two senses, now in the sort of era that we live in and right now uh, when we're coming out of the pandemic, we hope, uh, in terms of the year, I think it, it does have very particular significance because if you look at what's happened in Western culture um, and certainly including Australian society, we've been moving inexorably away from our sense of ourselves as interconnected in the direction of thinking of ourselves more as individuals. We've become a very individualistic, competitive and materialistic culture and all of that is a way of masking this deeper reality about ourselves so I think we've been heading for a kind of existential crisis uh, in western culture because it's against our true nature to have become so individualistic uh, I mean in Australia things like our shrinking households every every fourth household now contains just one person a high rate of relationship breakdown between 35 and 40 percent of marriages are ending in divorce. Um, uh, our busyness, um, uh, um, our, our mobility, we're, we're moving house on average once every six years. That means we're moving in and out of communities and not putting our roots down in the way that, that's more typical of us in the past. And of course, our adoption of information technology, which has been an absolute godsend during the pandemic, mm -hmm. but can be uh, curiously a way of keeping it. I mean, the, the great promise is it will make us more connected than ever, which is true. But of course, it also makes it easier than ever to stay apart from each other, which is why among uh, heavy users of social media, particularly young users, uh, we now have um, uh, psychologists talking about this phenomenon of being connected but lonely. The highest levels of loneliness are to be found in the heaviest users of social media. In fact, some work done by Swinburne University uh, a couple of years ago in association with the Australian Psychological Society found that, what I've just described, but also that 25% of Australians report feeling lonely most of the time. That, that's every fourth person that we're moving amongst is experiencing this pang of loneliness for most of every week. That seems to be an extraordinary symptom of what I'm describing here, which is what happens when we become more individualistic and less communitarian, less, less community-minded in our thinking. So that's, that's sort of the big picture response to your question, Prue, but I think the, the more immediate response is the pandemic, because we've all had a little taste 
of social isolation, even if you're living in a family household, isolated from the extended family and from friends and perhaps work colleagues and so on. We've all, I think as a result of this taste of social isolation, our appetite for being connected has been sharpened. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've behaved, I, I, as a matter of fact, I think that I'm, I'm currently thinking of Victoria as the love state because in Victoria and particularly in Melbourne, where huge demands have been made on the population and they rose to the occasion brilliantly. And I think that was compassion on a large scale. That was people saying, we've got to look out for each other's health. We've got to do something that's a bit uncomfortable, a bit unwelcome for us. Yes, it's in our own interests, but we're doing this to save lives. We're doing this to prevent the spread not just to us, but around our city and around our state. Now, I think that getting that taste of the common good mm. against the background of what I've been describing of a more socially fragmented society is something we're not going to forget. And it's incredibly contrasting to what we're seeing in places like the US and, yes. and the UK, yes. which we would consider to be kind of equivalent Western societies. Mm. So what's, what's happening differently, do you think? Yes. Um, yeah, we have. I mean, we grew up, I certainly grew up thinking of uh, the, the UK and the US as the great exemplars of Western society, you know, societies we should admire. The more we find out about them, the more we realise they're, they're, they're not quite so admirable after all. Mm -hmm. And in both of those societies, the process of social fragmentation and the rise of loneliness uh, and, and social isolation is far more advanced than it is here. The UK a couple of years ago actually appointed a minister for loneliness uh, in their government. Um, that, that person resigned. I don't know whether they've been replaced, um, but that was, I think, the wrong response, but that was a government mm -hmm. response to say, well, this is such a problem. We need, actually, we need a ministry in the government devoted to this. Uh, and America, we know, is, is you know, the land of the free. <laughs> That's their great claim. And what they mean by that is we're all free to please ourselves. They've got the pursuit of happiness enshrined in their constitution. Mm. Uh, and they think of that as an individual pursuit. They don't mean the pursuit of well-being for our communities. They mean I'm entitled to, to my happiness or I'm entitled to tote my gun. It's a very, you know, it's, it's, it's the neoliberal competitive society taken to its extreme naturally. A society whose culture has moved in that direction is not going to be nearly as prepared to wear masks even oh. and stay home for a month. Uh, so I think we have much to be thankful for. Now, there are plenty of things wrong with our society, of course, but we have much to be thankful for in, in that we had not moved so far in the direction of competitive individualism that we were not able to bring ourselves back from the brink. And I think we have brought ourselves back from the brink. And I think people will look back on this, particularly young adults who've been having a very hard time, very high levels of unemployment. Uh, and some people, of course, have, you know, have established businesses early in their adult lives, have lost those businesses, very difficult time. But I spent um, quite a lot of my research years talking to older Australians, particularly those who'd lived through the Great Depression, mm. who also lived through the Spanish flu and World War II. Um, they're all dead now. Um, but what they said was, when we look back on that experience, we realise it was the making of us. Because it, it comes precisely to the point of your question, Prue, what they'd learned from living through particularly the Depression was their absolute reliance on neighbours, on being part of a neighbourhood. Unemployment then was far worse than it is now and went on for far longer. And, of course, there was nothing like the social security uh, net that we now have for people who are doing it tough. There was no job keeper or job uh, seeker in mm -hmm. those days. So, but those people looked back on and said it was terrible the hardship, the adversity, the deprivation was terrible. We, you know, we had to put food on our neighbour's table sometimes as well as our own. And yet it really clarified our values. It really ordered our priorities. 
and we're grateful for values that never left us. And I think there'll be a COVID generation yeah. who will look back and say that that was no fun, but boy, it really got us thinking about how we do need each other. The pandemic <laughs> itself is a reminder of how connected we are. The, the, the coronavirus doesn't only in, uh, attack ABC employees or Buddhists or um, you know single women or something. It's humans that it's interesting to remind her that we really are one thing. It's fascinating you talk about that because then, so you think about those those discussions and those comments and you, you immediately think of those people who say, well, it was, all, it was all much better back when life was simpler. And you, of course, talk a lot about nostalgia as being a place of hiding as well. So even while we're talking about these sorts of things, we need to keep in mind the reality of those situations, don't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and, yes, I, I've, I've identified... By the way, uh, well, I've identified nostalgia as a, as a hiding place, and you made this point about busyness, and we can make it about nostalgia. There is absolutely nothing wrong. Some people are trapped in a spiral of busyness at certain points in their lives, particularly if they're juggling a job, aged parents, young children, etc. How could they be anything but busy? Some people really enjoy little bursts of nostalgia and reflecting on what it was like when the first Holden came off the production line, etc. Um uh, nothing wrong with with that. It's often how we connect with other people, isn't it? Yeah, as well. yeah. And, and yeah, absolutely, nothing wrong with ambition. Uh, nothing wrong with devotion to our work. The problem, of course, is when those things become hiding places. Mm. So we can hide in nostalgia as a way of insulating us from our responsibilities to the present moment. We can hide in our busyness. We can hide in our work. Uh, we can hide in our ambition in our materialism, all those things, but they aren't necessarily hiding places unless uh, we are using them. And I mean, this is partly connected with our position in the life cycle, Prue. I I think we've got to acknowledge that in the first half of life, broadly speaking, um, we're all very concerned about establishing our identity and finding our place in the world and perhaps finding a partner and deciding whether or not to have kids and what sort of job to do and where to live and all those sort of things that are part of our identity, of course. And we don't often reflect deeply on on the inner self. But as I, as I said in my remarks, you know, around about, around about our midlife, we often do start thinking uh, about about the deeper sense of self. And there's a very interesting graph based on global research, including Australia. It's a, it's a U-shaped graph that shows that life satisfaction after childhood, life satisfaction tends to decrease yeah. as we move through our 20s and 30s and 40s and then to pick up. Uh, so that people in their 50s, 60s and 70s typically report a deeper, richer sense of life satisfaction than when they were in their 20s, 30s and 40s. What is that about? I think it's about recognising that there were hiding places from the self that they've come out of and they're more prepared to be open to this idea of our common humanity and less prepared, more more compassionate, more patient, more tolerant um, because they're no longer striving so hard to establish their identity. I'd like to talk a bit more uh, in a minute about the first steps towards that for for somebody who might might have identified that that's something they need to do. But we have had some questions come through. So um, I I love this one. How do you reconcile common humanity with humans' spiritual dimension and the desire for religious belief? Mm. Yes, um, our, our, our common humanity is more than just our capacity for compassion, um, more, more than just our sense of in, interdependence. There are other things that humans share, and one of them is uh, this sense of the numinous, this sense of uh, some kind of transcendental meaning that people would like to attach to their lives. And through human history, there have always been uh, Um, movements, practices, uh, cultural ideas that we would now describe as religious, uh, designed to encourage that kind of reflection 
and designed to, re generally speaking, designed to reinforce the positive aspects of our compassionate nature. Um, so it's very interesting in contemporary Australian society that religious observance is at an all-time low. Um, we, we in, in terms of the Christian religion, regular churchgoers, that is to say weekly churchgoers, uh, that's about 8 or 9% of the Australian population. It gets up to about 25% at Christmas or Easter uh, and about 15% once a month or more often. So that's still a substantial minority, but it's, but it's a minority. However, uh, in the last census, 52% of Australians identified as Christian. So they are still wanting in some way uh, to hang on to an aspect of their cultural heritage, which is religious in its origins. They might say, I'm interested in Christian values rather than the dogma of the Catholic Church or the Uniting Church, whatever it might be. Um, but still, they wanted to identify as Christian. And then, of course, there are about another uh, 10 to 15 percent of Australians who identify with some other religion. Hinduism is our fastest growing religion, um, Judaism, Islam, uh, Buddhism, etc. So, in other words, about two thirds of us identify with some religious identity. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that, as the questioner says, there is a spiritual dimension to our understanding of what it means to be human. Some people will nurture that through mindfulness practice or through meditation, through non religious spiritual exercises of one kind or another. Um, but for some people, uh, actual formal religion is the way they the way they do that. By the way, just mentioning meditation, can I just chuck in one other yeah. thing while I'm uh, while it comes to my mind? I think it's very, when I was talking about the demands of love, that it's quite tough to be compassionate. I, I think we've got to recognise that that's true, and that there is such a thing as compassion fatigue. Definitely, mm. and I think. People who've made a commitment to the discipline of compassion, who've, in other words, understood what it really means to be a fully human being, need every day to set aside time for themselves uh, to get off the hook, uh, mm -hmm. to, to spend time meditating or reading or singing or walking or um, whatever it might be. Uh, not as a self-indulgence, but, but as a way of replenishing our resort. We need some solitude. We need some reflective time to top up our, our reserves so that we are ready for this demanding business of being mm. a loving. Lynn asks, um, hi, Hugh. She says, yeah, you say that we can handle our, uh, our fears and anxieties more easily if we have acknowledged that, like everyone else, we're, designed, we're destined to live with fears and anxieties, but that makes us uncomfortable and vulnerable. What are your thoughts on how we can do vulnerability well, particularly in 2020? Mm. Yes, we have to learn to do vulnerability well because that's who we are. We are a vulnerable species, by which I mean we are emotionally vulnerable, we are easily hurt, we're easily offended, um, uh, Disappointment comes to all of us, feelings of failure, pain, loss, etc. Crucial parts of learning what it means to be human is learning to live with uncertainty, insecurity, and the inherent vulnerability. And we're also vulnerable, of course, in the sense that we cling to life by the merest thread. Uh, it could be a pandemic, it could be a nuclear war, it could be a meteor strike, it could be a terminal illness that that wipes us out at, at a young age. We're all vulnerable to this. Life is inherently insecure. And I think that that's a source of inspiration. Uh, I, there's, there's a wonderful a quote from uh, Saul Bellow, who describes death as the dark backing on the glass that turns it into a mirror. So we can really only see ourselves when we've confronted the, the ultimate vulnerability of human existence, which is the inevitability of our death. Uh, so I don't think that's a morbid thing. I, I think that's a really uh, 
rich a, a way of enriching our experience of life every day to acknowledge that we are vulnerable and to acknowledge that although we talk about the pursuit of happiness and all that stuff that's that's not what life is about life is about rich meaningfulness about deep satisfactions but they often come out of painful experiences in fact, I, I read some, this, this, this um, may resonate with you, Prue. I, you mentioned earlier the presence of a four-year-old in your life. <laughs> yes. There's some interesting research published by a Harvard psychologist a few years ago showing that parents are at their happiest when they are away from their children, uh, but that their deepest and richest sense of the meaning of their lives mm. come from being a parent. So the stuff that enriches us, the stuff that gives us deep satisfaction is often associated with our vulnerability, um, with, with difficulties. Being kind, being compassionate uh, towards people doesn't necessarily make you happy, uh, although it will, it will uh, deepen your sense of life's meaning and life's satisfaction. I have so many more questions for you and we've run out of time. I think we are just going to have to invite you to come down to Ballarat when all the borders open and when, you know, you're able to do it uh, because we would love to have you again. It's been an absolute delight speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Prue. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Hugh McKay and uh, his book is The Inner Self. I highly recommend it uh, for you. And for once you read it, uh, as I say, you'll probably want to give it to all of your friends and family um, <laughs> because you will recognise them in the book. Um, now, that uh, so that comes to the end of our uh, Twilight Talk for this evening. Thanks, everybody, for jumping on to the live stream. We have many more to come, and I'll hand over now to our marvellous Sam uh, McColl from uh, our venue coordination team uh, to tell you a bit more about it. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Prue. Um, and again, a big thank you to Hugh um, for coming on tonight. Um, a really marvellous talk. Um, and again, I, I'd like to back Prue's suggestion that you should go out and purchase the book. Um, it's available at all good booksellers, including Collins here in Ballarat for around $35. Um, so I definitely suggest that you give that a purchase and give it a read. Um, we have more Twilight Talks coming up. So this is the first Twilight Talk in a six part series. Um, you can find all of the Twilight Talks at our Eventbrite page, which is right there on your screen, ballaratmi.org.au forward slash Twilight Talks 2020. That'll have all the links to the different Twilight Talks and there is still one to be announced. So the date is there. However, there isn't any link because we haven't set it up just yet. Um, and that'll hopefully be announced by next Friday. Um, that's about all from me. Um, the Twilight Talks uh, that are coming up, we have some in-person tickets available, which is very, very exciting. We can have an in-person audience back at the Ballarat Mechanics Institute once again. Um, and they will again be live streamed right here on YouTube where you're watching this one now. So make sure that you check back in and have a look at, at those nights. Uh, we do have some other exciting events coming up, which will be uh, launched very shortly. So make sure you keep an eye on our website and on our social media pages at Facebook and Instagram. We'll have lots of stuff going on. We have some live music coming up. Uh, for leading into Christmas, we'll be doing some Christmas shopping nights at the Mechanics Institute as well. So make sure you keep an eye on those. Once again, thank you very much for coming along tonight, everyone, and I hope you have a very good night. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. We can